On July 2, 2008, a 53-year-old woman named Carol Kennedy went out for a jog in Prescott, Arizona. Carol usually started her evenings like that, as she was a very active woman who enjoyed exercise. She returned home a little after 7 p.m. that Wednesday. After making dinner, Carol called her 83-year-old mother, Ruth Kennedy, who lived in Nashville, Tennessee, to see how she was doing. Calling her mother had become a nightly tradition for Carol as she always made sure to check in with her mother and see if everything was okay since Ruth lived alone. Ruth and Carol usually talked into the night during their nightly calls. However, this particular call only lasted a few minutes before coming to an abrupt end. Confused, Ruth wondered what could have happened to Carol, and a part of her was frightened because she could have sworn she heard Carol scream out the words, Oh no, before the call was disconnected. Ruth tried to call Carol numerous times after that, but her calls weren't going through. Her worry grew with every passing second, and it wasn't long before she called the Yavapai County Sheriff's Office. I was on the phone with my daughter, and she screamed and said, Oh no, and the phone's gone dead. Can, is there anything you can do? To, can you go check? She's out there, and she screamed and said, Oh no, and then the phone was dropped, and I'm just at my wit's end. Now, did you call her, or did she call you, and, and this occurred? She called me tonight, and we, she calls me every night, because I'm 83, and she worries about me. Mm -hmm. And so we were we were just having our conversation, and then all of a sudden she just screamed and said, oh, no. And then I haven't been able to get her to answer the phone back. So, I'm, you know, I'm afraid something bad's happened. Okay, Ruth. And who does your daughter live with? Uh, she's recently divorced. She's alone. What's your daughter's name? Uh, Carol Kennedy. Do you believe that there's any reason that she would be concerned if her husband, ex-husband came back? Oh, I don't think so. Okay. No, I don't think it's that kind of a thing, you know. Okay. All right, we will send somebody out to uh, check on her and we'll have them give you a call. After Ruth's call, a sheriff's deputy made his way to Carol's home. When he arrived, he was met with a horrific crime scene. Carol was found dead in a pool of blood. The back of her head was badly disfigured, and she was lying face down at the base of a ladder. The crime scene pointed to an accident as the cause of death, but the deputy and the detectives on the scene already knew that it was a murder. Carol's skull had been shattered by repeated blows to the head, and it was clear to the authorities that she had been brutally beaten. As the investigators continued looking through the gruesome crime scene, they told themselves that whoever committed the ghastly act must have hated the victim. An investigation was carried out to identify Carol's murderer. The detectives got to work immediately, questioning anyone who arrived at the scene. While they didn't know it at the time, this murder case would grow to become one of the most bizarre and perplexing murder cases the town of Prescott, Arizona had ever seen. This is Monsters. Carol Kennedy was often described as a kind-hearted and loving woman by the people around her. She was born in 1955 and grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. After completing her studies, Carol got married to her partner at the time, but the couple's marriage didn't last long. Carol quickly moved on with her life after the separation, and it was during that period that she met the person she believed was her soulmate, a man named Stephen DeMacher. 28-year-old Steve was a handsome and well-educated man. He was born in January of 1954 to parents John and Janice DeMacher. He was the oldest of nine children and was known as a gentle and fun-loving person that everyone wanted to be around. Stephen had fallen madly in love with Carol shortly after their first meeting. He had no doubts in his mind that she was the one for him, and after dating for a while, Steve asked Carol to marry him. The couple got married on October 10, 1982. Since they both shared a love of outdoors, they decided to have an outdoor wedding in Steve's parents' backyard, which overlooked Lake Ontario in Rochester, New York. It was a beautiful ceremony and the happiest day of their lives. After their wedding, Steve and Carol moved around for some time before finally settling in Prescott, Arizona. 
Married life was bliss for the couple. Steve was an avid lover of adventures, and he shared his love of the outdoors with Carol by taking her mountain climbing, hiking, kayaking, and skiing. Carol wasn't as fond of the outdoors as Steve was in the beginning, but she grew to love it just as much as he did, and she enjoyed the adventures they had together. It wasn't long before the couple's adventuring days were put on hold as Carol gave birth to their first child, a little girl named Katie. A few years after Katie's birth, the couple had their second child, another girl named Charlotte. Steve and Carol loved their daughters and raised them with all the care in the world. Steve would take his daughters on the same outdoor adventures he took Carol on, and whenever the family wasn't exploring the outside, they stayed at their dream house located at the foot of Granite Mountain, a beautiful home that Carol had designed. During that time, Steve worked as a professor at Prescott College, where he had graduated. After some time as a professor, Steve was made the dean of the college. Carol also taught dream psychology at the college and was greatly admired by her students, as her classes were always full. In addition to teaching, Carol had become an artist, specializing in printmaking, an art process that creates artwork by printing on paper, fabric, metal, or wood. Carol enjoyed expressing herself through her printmaking, which combined painting, drawing, and graphic arts. Whenever she wasn't teaching or creating art, Carol worked as a therapist, helping addicts in a local women's clinic and counseling domestic violence survivors. At that point, Steve and Carol had spent more than 20 years together. Charlotte was in high school and Katie was in college. Even after all those years, Carol still referred to Steve as the love of her life. She looked forward to the many more years she would spend with Steve, but after a while, Carol noticed how the man she had fallen in love with had started to change. The first change started with Steve's job. He left his job as the dean of Prescott College to become a financial advisor. The move from academics to the world of finance proved successful for Steve, as he was earning $300,000 to $500,000 a year. For the first time in years, Carol and Steve weren't working together and, unbeknownst to them, Steve's career change was the catalyst that would lead to disaster in their marriage. The good pay wasn't the only thing that came with Steve's job as he started having affairs with numerous women. Steve would fund the affairs with his increased pay, even putting some of his lovers up in his condo off Camelback Road in Phoenix. Steve soon became an avid cheater, with over 17 different women during their marriage. Carol was a very smart woman, so it didn't take long before she found out. Things got even worse for Carol when she looked into his lovers and realized that her perfect husband had been unfaithful far before his new job. Steve had apparently been sleeping with her midwife while she was pregnant. The affairs took a huge toll on their marriage. Even with his infidelities out in the open, Steve continued to profess his undying love for Carol. And while she was hurt, Carol didn't want to throw away the 20-plus years they had spent together. Steve had promised to stop the infidelities and do everything to make it work, but as months passed, Carol realized that all of Steve's promises were false as he kept seeing other women. Carol eventually confronted Steve again and asked him to see a counselor as she believed he was a sex addict, but Steve never made it to any of the counseling sessions, claiming he didn't have time for counseling. As the months passed, the couple's marriage kept deteriorating. Carol loved Steve with all of her heart, but there was only so much she could take. She eventually had enough and asked for a separation. Steve didn't want to let Carol go as he claimed to still love her, but while he said one thing, his actions proved otherwise and he continued with the affairs. Carol had fought hard for her marriage, but she knew it was on its way to a bitter end. Their lives were moving in completely different directions, so they separated in 2005, finally getting a divorce in 2008. After the divorce, Carol left teaching to focus on her art. She used her pain from the divorce to express herself. Many of Carol's close friends noticed the change in her art style. One friend remarked, quote, It definitely showed in her artworks, especially the colors. They were much darker and much moodier. Even with the change in style, Carol continued to find success in her artwork. She got to display her beautiful paintings on an entire wall at the remarkable Van Gogh's Ear Gallery on Whiskey Row in Prescott. In addition to venting her emotions through art, Carol found another outlet where she could express herself and talk about her feelings. That outlet was a man named Jim Knapp. A little while after the divorce, Carol rented out a guest cottage that was 50 feet away from the main house to help with her expenses, and her tenant was Jim. 
The guest house had its own kitchen and bathroom, so there was no need for the tenant to go into the main house. Nevertheless, Carol and Jim found themselves growing closer, and they soon became friends. People described Jim as a free-spirited guy from Hawaii, odd but easy to get along with. Jim was also a divorced father who had been diagnosed with skin cancer, and both Jim and Carol became each other's support during their shared difficult times. It was hard at first, but Carol was slowly getting over the divorce and finding herself after the separation. As for Steve, things were much worse. After the divorce had been settled, Steve started to face the reality of their separation. The court ordered him to pay $6,000 in monthly alimony payments. Considering his yearly income, that fee should have been easy to pay, but he was experiencing severe financial difficulties. For starters, all the money Steve had used for his affairs had come back to haunt him. Reports also stated that Steve had lost large sums of money for his clients, and his average income at the time was less than $13,000 a month. Steve had approximately $30,000 in monthly expenses, and since he couldn't meet them with his monthly salary, he started doing whatever he could to make ends meet. He borrowed money from his parents, took out lines of credit on both of his homes, spent money from retirement accounts, and used credit cards extensively. Steve had dug himself into a hole of debt that he wasn't going to be able to pay off. The economic crisis of 2008 only made matters worse, and as his debt and money problems grew, so did his frustrations and anger. On June 2, 2008, Steve vented his growing discontent and annoyance in an email to Carol. The message from Steve read, quote, It's a little exasperating to have settled on an agreement that provides for you as well as it does, and to be facing eight years of writing very large checks on the first of every month, on top of spending more years than that paying off the debt we have now left to me, only to have you continue to berate me as though you have been mistreated. I mean, you were cheating on her, Steve. Steve's angry rant got him nowhere, as his situation remained the same. As his financial hole kept getting deeper and deeper, Steve sent Carol another frustration-filled email on June 14th that read, quote, I will not be pushed any further. You have extracted all you will extract from me. I am in such incredibly worse financial condition than you are and will be for many years to come. You get to start clean while I dig out of a staggering hole while I'm trying to pay out $400,000 in after-tax dollars to send our girls to college. My income has dropped by almost half. My financial advisor practice is in pieces, and you got a settlement based on what is likely the biggest year of my career. Steve sent a few more messages complaining about the same thing, but as the month of June passed by, he seemed to have calmed down and accepted his obligatory payments. He was also able to put aside his frustrations for the rest of the month so he could be cordial with Carol. As the days passed, both Carol and Steve seemed to be in a good place in their relationship. Things were going so well that the whole family got together on June 28th to see Katie off to the airport. Katie was going on a trip to study abroad in South Africa, and the entire family wanted to give her a proper send-off. It was a very pleasant meeting, with everyone smiling and happy. Steve had his arm around Carol, and she had her arm around Charlotte as they all waved Katie goodbye. About four days had passed since the pleasant meeting at the airport, and Carol had just woken up for a new day in her home. She glanced at the calendar, and it was July 2nd, 2008. Carol didn't have any specific plans, so she spent that Wednesday like she usually did. She started the day by going to work, and after a productive session, she left around 5.30 p.m. Before Carol went home, she took a detour to the store to buy the ingredients she needed to make a salad. She'd also been texting Charlotte about a new job she had gotten. Carol had asked Charlotte how the training was going, and Charlotte said things were going really well. After a few more texts, she sent a final message to Charlotte that read, quote, I love you. Carol had gotten home around 6 p.m., and a few minutes later, she went out for her evening jog on a familiar path called the Bridal Path, located at the base of Granite Mountain. She jogged until it was 7 p.m. before making her way home. Carol entered her home through the back door, and she went to the kitchen to make a salad for dinner. After she'd finished eating, she got her laptop and answered some emails. When that was done, the only thing left for her to do that evening was to call her mother Ruth before going to bed. She always called Ruth every evening, and that day wasn't any different. Carol picked up the phone and dialed her mother. Their call started at 7.36 p.m. Carol asked Ruth how she was, and her mother told her she was fine. Carol then spoke to her mother about a few things on her mind. 
she talked to Ruth about the divorce and how she was moving on from it. After talking for a little while, Carol brought up something that had been worrying her. She told her mother that Steve hadn't made his monthly alimony payment on the first of the month. Carol then told Ruth that she was going to call her lawyer first thing in the morning to talk about it. But before Carol could finish her plans, she suddenly said the words, oh no, as if she'd seen something or someone that wasn't supposed to be there. Before she could say anything else, the phone went dead. Right after that, the Yavapai County Sheriff's Office received a 911 call from Ruth Kennedy asking them to check on her daughter Carol at her home in Prescott. After the call, Deputy Sheriff Winslow was dispatched to the home on Bridal Path. As the deputy made his way to the house, Ruth tried to call the only other person she felt could help her, Carol's ex-husband Steve. Steve didn't answer Ruth's call, and after attempting a few more times, she left him a message. Ruth wasn't the only one who couldn't reach Steve that night. Charlotte had also been unable to reach him. That night, Charlotte was waiting at her father's house with her boyfriend, Jacob Janicek. Jacob had been having problems with his parents, so he was living with Charlotte and her dad at the time. They were waiting for him to come home so they could have dinner, but Steve was running late. The last time Charlotte had seen him was around 5.15 that evening, and he told her he was going on a mountain bike ride. Even at his age, that was still a fairly normal evening activity for Steve, which is why Charlotte didn't question it. She knew her father loved outdoor activities. However, when it got pretty late and Steve hadn't come home yet, Charlotte started to get worried. She thought he might have injured himself or gotten into an accident while he was out, so she called him at 9.40 p.m. Steve didn't pick up and it raised Charlotte's concerns. She knew that her father took his phone everywhere he went, so not getting an answer from him was very unusual. As the minutes passed by and Steve still hadn't arrived, Charlotte and Jacob decided to go to the grocery store to get some ingredients for the vegetable stir-fry they had planned to make. They arrived at the grocery store at 10 p.m. and spent 13 minutes picking the ingredients. Luckily, while they were at the checkout, Charlotte finally received a call from Steve. He told her that his phone had died after he had gotten a flat tire, which is why he couldn't call home. He then explained how he went to the nearby gym to continue his workout before telling Charlotte that he was on his way home. The call from her father put Charlotte's mind at ease, and by the time she and Jacob arrived home, Steve had put his clothes in the washing machine and was taking a shower. After his shower, Steve explained what had happened again, but as he was talking, Charlotte noticed that he seemed a bit restless and tense, which was unusual for him. She also noticed that there were fresh scratches and bright red cut marks on her father's arms and legs. She asked him about it, and he told her he probably got them walking through the rough bushes and tree branches on the mountain path. Charlotte was just glad that her father had come home safely, so after he got dressed, they all sat down to have a late dinner around 11 p.m. Charlotte and Jacob had almost cleared their plates, and as they were about to finish dinner and head to bed, Steve said something that made both of them very worried. He told them that he had received an unusual call from Carol's brother right after he had charged his phone, telling him that Carol had been unreachable after she was strangely cut off during a call with her mother earlier that night. Charlotte became worried for a second time, but she knew nothing could have happened since she had just been texting her mother a few hours ago. Just to make sure everything was alright, she decided to call her. Carol didn't answer the phone, so Charlotte left her a message asking if everything was alright and telling her to call her back when she had a chance. I had informed grandmother that something happened while you guys were on the phone and she was kind of worried about you, so I wanted to text you and see if everything was okay and I'm kind of getting worried about you. So if you want to text me back or call me or something, just let me know that you're okay and that everything's okay. After some time passed and Carol still hadn't called back, Charlotte started getting nervous. She called hospitals in the area asking if anyone named Carol Kennedy had been admitted. However, all the hospitals they dialed told them they didn't have any patients by that name. As the worry for her mother grew, Charlotte decided to go check on Carol at her house with Jacob and her father, but Steve said he couldn't go. He told them that while he was worried about Carol, they had just come out of a fresh divorce and he didn't want to intrude on her personal time by walking in on her when she could possibly be with another guy. Charlotte and Jacob understood why Steve would feel uncomfortable barging in on her, so they decided to go without him. They promised to call and fill him in on everything as soon as they arrived. 
But while they embarked on their trip to Carol's house around midnight, the sheriff's deputy who was dispatched earlier had already arrived. It was dark and quiet at Carol's house. The lights were off, so Deputy Winslow assumed there was no one home. But just to be sure, he took out a flashlight and shined it into the windows to see if he could spot anything out of the ordinary. It wasn't long before something horrific caught his eye. There was blood everywhere, as most of the furniture Deputy Winslow could see was stained with blood, and a few seconds later, he finally laid his eyes on a body. The deputy immediately called for backup, and investigators and additional officers made their way to the scene. One of the first to arrive was investigator Mike Sachet, and he and Deputy Winslow looked around the scene to understand what had happened there. The first thing they noticed was both the ladder and the bookcase were tipped over, which pointed to falling as the reason for death. They couldn't find any signs of forced entry, so the victim must have been alone. Their initial theory was that she had fallen from the tipped ladder in the living room and hit her head on the corner of a nearby desk. It seemed like the most plausible explanation, but something about that story didn't feel right to them. It was only when they looked closer that they found out why. For starters, there were blood stains on the carpet, but none could be found on the ladder. That raised suspicion that the victim was probably moved after she started bleeding and the killer had set the ladder in place after the victim was killed. As they examined further, they also found drops of blood outside of the door, which further aligned with their theory. After they looked past the obvious, the investigators knew without a doubt that the scene had been staged. Investigators inspected Carol's body and knew that a fall couldn't have caused the trauma to the back of her head. The massive amount of splattered blood that covered Carol's body and the nearby furniture led them to believe that she was viciously beaten to death with a foreign object. What they weren't able to figure out was the object that was used to strike her. As the body was taken away by the coroner, one thing became clear to the detectives. This wasn't just a random act of violence by an unknown individual. The manner in which Carol was murdered seemed very personal because whoever did this struck her numerous times in the back of the head with a foreign object. That fact alone led them to believe that there was a deep resentment behind Carol's murder because there was absolutely no need for the excessive violence shown by the killer if the attack was carried out by a stranger. The investigation started almost immediately as the detectives traced the drops of blood leading outside. It led them to a slew of tracks outside Carol's home. It was hard to pinpoint something at first as numerous people as well as horses and other animals go through that area, but there was a specific shoe print that piqued their interest. They managed to identify the victim's shoe prints from her jog earlier that evening, but there was something else. Another set of fresh shoe prints could be seen over Carol's prints. It seemed the killer had stepped directly onto one of her shoe prints as he made his way to her home when she went out for her jog. They were able to trace a clear succession of those prints to the house. The detectives then sealed off the area as they planned to take clearer images of the shoe prints when it was light out for further analysis. It wasn't long before Jim Knapp arrived at the scene and was questioned by detectives. Jim explained his relationship with Carol and how he was her tenant, but he couldn't remember when he moved in. When asked where he had been that night, Jim told the detectives that he was babysitting his son at his ex-wife's home, a story that was later confirmed. Right before the end of his questioning, Jim would tell the detectives a disturbing theory on who he believed might be responsible for the atrocity committed that night. Jim told the detectives that they should look into Steve DeMocker, as he had always felt that Steve was sneaky and manipulative. The second people to arrive at the crime scene were Charlotte and Jacob. They weren't allowed on the premises, but they were informed of what had happened by an officer who told the victim's daughter that her mother had unfortunately passed away. Charlotte immediately burst into tears, and Jacob called Steve, who rushed to the scene. Once he arrived, the detective studied his initial reactions to the news. Steve seemed to be shocked and confused. He was clearly at a loss for words and had a dismayed look on his face. He was also holding back tears as he held his sobbing daughter. While Steve truly looked to be a grieving husband who had just lost someone he genuinely cared about, the detectives weren't sold on his reactions at the crime scene. They hadn't forgotten what Jim had told them and suspicions had already started to creep in, so Steve was asked to follow them back to the sheriff's department where he would undergo more rigorous questioning and try to clear up the growing doubts the investigators had against him. 
Once they arrived, Steve told the officers the same story he'd been telling all night. He seemed to be very cooperative as he assured them that he would tell them whatever they needed to know. He explained how he told his daughter he was going mountain biking between 5 and 5.30 p.m. He also added that he didn't mountain bike very often. Steve told the detectives that he arrived at the trailhead at around 6 or 6.30 p.m. He'd apparently planned to keep riding for two and a half hours on a route that he had drawn out earlier, but that's when his tire went flat. The detectives found some inconsistencies in Steve's story, as his planned route would have kept him on the road until after sunset. Steve was then asked to draw out his planned route for the detectives, and it led to a disturbing discovery. During Steve's recollections, the detectives realized that there was a point in his route that put him a mile away from Carol's house. Things got even worse from there, as it was during that same time period that Charlotte called him at around 9.40 and got no answer. Further investigations also showed that not answering his phone was very out of character for Steve, as past accounts showed that he had always had a charged cell on him so his daughters could reach him at any time of the day, and that that night was the only exception. In addition to all that, the detectives also looked into cell records and it revealed that Steve's phone was powered off from 5.36 p.m. to 10.05 p.m., a time frame that perfectly coincided with the estimated time of Carol's murder. The detectives' suspicions were at an all-time high now as they believed Steve purposefully went off the grid to carry out the murder. That theory put Steve's entire testimony in question, as the detectives were fully convinced his phone never really died and that he was at Carol's house all along. But no matter how much they tried to get him to confess, Steve vehemently denied ever being at Carol's house. He even went as far as to offer the detectives his DNA for comparison, as he believed that it would prove without a doubt that he was telling the truth. After numerous unsuccessful attempts to get a confession out of Steve, the detectives turned their attention to the visible scratch marks and cuts on his body. They asked him to explain how he got them. Steve told the detectives that he had gotten the scratch marks from some thorny bushes and branches on a rough mountain trail. He was then asked if he had any other injuries and he said no. Steve was then told to stand up and the scratches were photographed. He wondered why he was still at the station, so he asked the detectives if he was one of their suspects. And, and right now we don't have any other person. Me. Well, we have no other person right now. I understand. No friends, no anything like that, that would, unless some random person just happened to walk in a room and do this. Um, we don't know what else. And I... Steve was asked again about the trail he used. It was revealed that the trail was eight miles away from where he lived, and the investigators had to ask themselves why he decided to go on an eight-mile bike ride on that particular day. The long distance raised pressing questions, and the detectives wanted him to shed a little more light on that. The proximity of where the trail is, I know. where you're riding, I wish I'd chosen a different trail. I wish you had chosen a different trail also. Um, because, and here, here's the thing, it's right now, if I, of course, if I had done it, I probably wouldn't have chosen to be right near the scene of what sounded like maybe a crime. The interrogation had crossed the hour mark, and Steve still hadn't confessed to anything. The detectives put their final efforts into getting Steve to talk, as they asked once again if anything at the crime scene would lead back to him. But Steve's story remained the same. With no further questions, Steve was released from the sheriff's department. Even after a more thorough investigation, the detectives weren't able to get anything on Steve. They felt like they already had their guy, but they couldn't prove any of their theories without any hard evidence. So all they could do was hope the results of Carol's autopsy would point them in the right direction. Dr. Philip Keene performed Carol's autopsy. After the examinations, he concluded that a round object had caused multiple blunt force injuries to her head, resulting in the victim's death. The victim had seven major skull fractures as she'd been struck seven times with that round object, an object that bore similarities and was shaped like the head of a golf club. The report was delivered the afternoon after the detectives had spent all night searching through Steve's residence during his interrogation. They had swept through every room in the house before moving towards the garage, and they took photographs of everything they saw. They had already examined the photographs, but the medical examiner's report led Detective Sachet to examine them again. 
he felt that there was something that had been overlooked, and as he was going through the images taken in the garage, he saw what he was looking for out of the corner of his eye. A set of golf clubs had been photographed in Steve's garage. Other detectives also remembered seeing the set, and they knew it couldn't have been a coincidence. They quickly rushed back to Steve's home to perform another search of the premises. After the subsequent search, Steve's golf clubs were taken, but after a thorough examination, they couldn't find any definitive evidence that proved any one of the clubs was the weapon used to kill Carol. It seemed like they were back to square one, but that's when one of the detectives remembered something from their initial search. He had seen an empty golf club cover for a Callaway brand driver called the Big Bertha Sevenwood, but during their second search, it had mysteriously disappeared. That led detectives to pay Steve's house a third visit, but no matter how hard they searched, they weren't able to find the club cover or the Big Bertha Sevenwood Club, the latter of which the detectives strongly believed was the murder weapon. Additional and very meticulous searches were also carried out looking for blood and similar evidence in Steve's washing machine, car, and pipe drains, but at the end of it all, the detectives weren't able to find anything. However, another shocking twist was soon revealed in the detective's investigation. DNA had been found under the fingernails of Carol's left hand, and to everyone's surprise, the mystery DNA didn't belong to Steve. Even with the discovery of new and unidentified DNA on Carol's body, the detectives kept investigating Steve. The authorities had dubbed the unidentified DNA sample Evidence Item Number 603. They also referred to the DNA sample as Mr. 603 as it was a male's DNA that was discovered, mixed with Carol's blood under her fingernails. Efforts were being made to identify the individual, but the investigative efforts into Steve were also doubled. Detectives had set their sights on the bike tracks and shoe prints found behind Carol's home as they felt taking a deeper look into them could be the key to incriminating Steve. Deputy Winslow had concluded that the tire pattern he'd been tracking on the crime scene was similar to the tire pattern on Steve's bike tires. So, even though it was a common bike tire, those specific tracks found so close to Carol's house had already tied Steve to the crime scene. Detectives on the scene also noted that Carol's shoes had three N's or three Z's on the sole. That was the very same shoe pattern that had been stepped over by unidentified shoe prints. Those shoe prints were believed to belong to the killer as they had been tracked near the crime scene. Investigators concluded that the unidentified shoe prints came from a specific kind of shoe, a brand called La Sportiva. During an additional search of Steve's residence, a receipt was retrieved and it showed Steve had purchased a pair in 2006. Unlike the bicycle tires, these shoes weren't very common as they were from a shoe model that only sold about 8,900 pairs nationwide. Furthermore, investigations also proved that Carol didn't have any pair of shoes that matched the freshly made shoe prints, and these prints were consistent with the treads on the La Sportiva shoes that Steve had worn in the past. However, those shoes weren't found during a search of Steve's house. As incriminating as it sounded, both the shoe prints and the bike tire tracks weren't enough to arrest the main suspect, so the detectives looked towards Steve's computer to see if they could find anything there. A digital forensics exam was carried out on Steve's computer to retrieve his search and online shopping history, and it led to a disturbing discovery. About one month before Carol's murder, Steve had used his laptop to search the internet for extensive details on how to kill and make it look like suicide. Five other morbid search queries were received from Steve's history, and they consisted of tips from a hitman on how to kill someone, payment of life insurance benefits in the case of a homicide, how to make a homicide appear like a suicide, and how to stage a suicide. The retrieved shopping history also showed that in August of 2008, Steve had bought four books that contained information on how to evade the authorities. These four books had been shipped to his office, and two of the four books were titled How to Change Your Identity and How to Disappear Until You Want to Be Found. There could have been a lot more data to be accessed, but Steve had set up the laptop with a privacy setting that automatically deleted his internet search histories, so investigators were only able to recover portions of the search history. 
Even though it was only a portion, the detectives had managed to gather even more incriminating evidence against Steve, and his search history pointed them in their next direction as they started looking into the life insurance policy Steve had on Carol. It didn't take long for the detectives to find out about two life insurance policies totaling $750,000 that Steve had on Carol, and Steve was the sole beneficiary of both. In addition to being free of his alimony payments, the detectives believed that the insurance money also served as a motive for Carol's murder. The detectives had finally uncovered a more definitive motive, and all they needed now was to find the murder weapon, as it was the only definite and incriminating item that couldn't be contested once found. That was still proving to be a challenge, but the more they looked, the worse it got for Steve as they began to uncover even more evidence. During their search, they found out that Steve had purchased a BMW motorcycle in July of 2008. Further investigations revealed that he had also asked his daughter to buy him multiple disposable prepaid cell phones, several hydration packs, and a GPS navigation unit. That motorcycle was later found in the garage of Steve's Scottsdale, Arizona residence with the GPS device, clothes, makeup, hair dye, and $15,000 in cash inside the motorcycle's saddlebags, along with a map of Mexico. Detectives knew Steve was going to try to flee the country, and it was only a matter of time before he would disappear right under their noses. So rather than focus their efforts on the golf club, they started to trace the golf club cover. They obtained a warrant to search his office, and after tearing the place apart, they eventually found something. It was a receipt for a Callaway driver with a matching cover which was purchased by Steve in 2003. While it wasn't the murder weapon they'd desperately been searching for, it was more than enough for them as the receipt proved without a doubt that the murder weapon was once in Steve's possession. The detectives felt Steve was hiding the golf club and its cover. They had already seen the cover in the photographs taken in Steve's garage, and they decided to focus their efforts on finding it as they felt it would lead them to the murder weapon. After the detectives had obtained the search warrant, Steve called his family and told them that he had found something in his girlfriend's car. When they asked what it was, Steve revealed that it was the club cover that the detectives had been tirelessly looking for. Steve swore he didn't know where it was before, implying that the cover must have blown into the car from the wind. Steve didn't know whether to give the club cover to the investigators or his attorney, but he eventually gave it to his attorney, John Sears, and Sears hid the cover in his office out of fear that it would compromise Steve. Because of that, the detectives were unable to find the golf club or its cover. They knew they were running out of time, as while they had found the receipt in Steve's office, it was still largely considered circumstantial evidence, just like everything else they had uncovered. They still had no physical evidence, as the murder weapon remained at large. There was also the fact that even with the large amounts of blood at the crime scene, there wasn't a single shred of Steve's DNA in Carol's house. No matter how hard they looked, they couldn't find anything, not even a hair that would tie him to the crime scene. Things were looking really bad for the detectives and the prosecutors, but they knew that they had to move forward with whatever evidence they had, whether it was circumstantial or not. The prosecutor still wasn't convinced the evidence would be enough to convict Steve, but it was enough to incriminate him and a warrant was put out for his arrest. Exactly three months after the murder of Carol Kennedy, Steve DeMocker was arrested while working at UBS Financial Services in October of 2008, and he was charged with first-degree murder. After Steve's arrest, the prosecutors began pushing for the death penalty. That was heartbreaking news for Steve's family, as they still strongly believed he was innocent. They were all horrified by the news of his arrest and his potential execution. Steve's family remained vocal against it, and eventually the death penalty was taken off the table before the trial began. As Steve's trial date approached, the Demockers felt the detectives had made a mistake and another person should be behind bars. The family's sole suspect was Jim Knapp, and they urged the detectives to look into him again. Steve's sister, Sharon Democker, was convinced Jim had more to do with the murder as she felt he wasn't an upstanding person. Jim had apparently been involved in some shady drug dealings, and it had also come to light that he'd been lying about still having cancer. Jim's medical records showed that while he did have a superficial type of skin cancer at one point, it had long been removed. 
In addition to that, there was also hard proof that Jim had unrequited feelings for Carol, and the family saw that as the main reason why he was quick to point fingers at Steve. Jim was still living in Carol's guest house for some time after the murder, but the Demockers quickly evicted him after Steve's arrest, as all of Steve's assets were handed over to his brother, James Democker. No matter what was said about their brother in the days before the trial, the Demockers stood by his side as they felt Carol's real killer was Jim. The detectives paid their theories no mind as they knew they were the words of a family in pain. However, a disturbing 911 call made to the Prescott Police Department just a few weeks later would change the minds of some detectives, as they started to wonder if there might be some truth to the Demacher story. The news came as a shock to everyone, as just five months after Carol's murder, Jim was found dead in a shabby Prescott apartment. The detectives who arrived at the scene found Jim's dead body on the floor with a bullet hole in the heart, and the bullet was found in the crawl space under the apartment. Numerous guns and spent shell casings were also discovered scattered around his apartment, and a dining table chair was placed right in the middle of Jim's bed. Both the medical examiner and the detectives ruled his death a suicide, but there was a lot of doubts about that conclusion. A few psychiatrists who later analyzed the case said that men don't usually kill themselves with a bullet to the heart. And even if he did kill himself, the mysterious manner in which Jim died started to raise a few suspicions as many people began to speculate that he might have done it out of guilt. After his death, the claims of Sharon DeMocker and the rest of his family started to seem a little bit more believable. A private investigator, Rich Robertson, who had been added to Steve's defense, also strongly believed that Jim had more to do with Carol's murder. He felt the detectives made a mistake by treating him like a witness and not a suspect. That was due to the fact that while Steve's DNA was never found at the crime scene, Jim's DNA was found on the door handle mixed with Carol's blood, and his thumbprints were also found in the house. That wasn't suspicious, though, because Jim was frequently inside Carol's home. The detectives called the growing claims and theories about Jim speculative as they had faith in their investigation. But on June 19, 2009, an email was sent to Steve's attorney, John Sears, and it contained a confession that claimed Steve wasn't the killer they'd been looking for. The anonymous email was sent on Friday at exactly 2.29 p.m., and it read, quote, I can't tell you who I am, but I can tell you what really happened the night Kennedy was killed. Knapp was running his mouth to Kennedy about a prescription drug deal he was in. Two men and one woman were sent to do them both. It was going to be a home invasion gone bad. Knapp and Kennedy used to drink together at night in the house. The two men would take them if they were together, and the woman would be out front. If Knapp was in his apartment, one man would take Kennedy, and the woman would take Knapp, and one man would be out front. The two men thought Kennedy and Knapp were together, but when they went into the back bedroom, they were wrong. Kennedy was on the phone, not talking to Knapp. One man started to leave, but they all ran into each other in the hall outside her bedroom. She tried to run out a side door, but one man got her. She didn't stay down, and there was a fight. The second man had an axe handle he had taken from her bedroom. When it was over, he threw it over the fence. They had to leave quickly because she had been on the phone. They couldn't finish arranging the house. One man left and the other man and woman stayed, waiting for a decision about Nap. Word came to walk away from Nap, but they stayed. And the next night they walked back into the house and found the axe handle they'd used and got rid of it. Nap was not killed by any of the men or the woman. This wasn't one crazed man with a golf club. The people you're looking for are major prescription drug suppliers in Phoenix connected to Mexico, Canada, and some other offshore operations. That's all I can say. The entire case had been turned upside down once again. If they were to believe the sender of the email, Jim's affiliation with a pharmaceutical drug gang in Phoenix might have caused Carol's death. The detectives had already confirmed Jim's participation in selling pharmaceuticals for the gang, and it started raising other questions and theories that, just like Carol, the gang might have been the ones who killed him too and staged his death as a suicide. A few investigators also supported that theory as they believed that the crime scene at Jim's apartment had been staged. The email was later shown to Steve at Camp Verde Jail, and with a shocked look on his face, Steve claimed to have heard the exact same story a month earlier through the vents in his prison cell. Steve said he didn't know the person's identity, but the statements made by the mystery person were similar to the statements made in the email. 
Steve got emotional and broke into tears as he told his attorneys that he was relieved to know what really happened to Carol. With every passing day, the rumors and theories surrounding Jim began to grow and the one man who could have cleared the air was already dead. In addition to all that was going on, private investigator Rich Robertson also reminded detectives of Mr. 603, another loose end that still needed to be solved. All that only increased the Democrats' belief in Steve's innocence. But regardless of the new discoveries, both the prosecutors and the detectives knew they had jailed the right man, and Steve's trial finally began in the summer of 2010. After numerous legal delays, Steve's murder trial finally commenced at the Yavapai County courtroom in downtown Prescott. Joe Butner was the lead prosecutor, and he told both the jurors and the judge that Steve bludgeoned his ex-wife to death with a golf club at the former couple's home on Bridal Path. Steve's repeated attack shattered her skull, and he staged the home to make her death look like an accident. The prosecutors believed Steve had two motives. The first was to cash in on her life insurance policy, and the second was to avoid the monthly alimony payments because he was in debt. He also acknowledged the fact that, while most of the evidence was circumstantial, it was still very incriminating. They told the juries everything they'd found, starting from the shoe prints and the bike tire tracks, Steve's morbid internet searches, the missing golf club and cover, and his detailed plan to escape. John Sears started by addressing the prosecutor's argument that Carol's life insurance was Steve's motive. Sears assured his audience that his defendant wanted nothing to do with that money. Steve had already told his daughters that the $750,000 in life insurance money was theirs. He told them that the money was from their mother to them, and it wasn't his. After Carol's death and a little while before Steve's arrest, the Hartford Insurance Company refused to pay Steve the $750,000 death benefit because he was a suspect, and he willingly ceded the rights to the money to his two daughters, and the money was paid to them. Now, that's not quite the same as saying he didn't want the money. He couldn't get the money, and in turn, had the insurance company give it to his daughters. What do you want to bet he still got his hands on that money? The defense also argued that the tire tracks found by the investigators were from a very common bicycle tire used in Prescott, and they said it was ludicrous to think Steve was the only one who possessed a pair of La Sportiva shoes in all of Prescott. Sears also explained the internet searches, saying Steve was an avid writer and the research was for a book. The only thing that was really incriminating was his plans to flee, and the defense said that those were the actions of a frightened man who thought he was going to be arrested for a crime he didn't commit. Many witnesses were called to the stand over the course of the trial. Ruth Kennedy was told to recall the events of that night. Charlotte's ex-boyfriend Jacob was also called to the stand and asked to talk about the missing golf club cover. From Jacob's testimony, the prosecutors revealed to the jurors that Steve had found the missing club cover, but instead of giving it to the authorities, he'd given it to his attorney out of fear that it would implicate him in the crime. The news surprised the jurors as it proved their point that Steve was trying to hide something, and that was one of the last statements made in court that day before it was adjourned. The trial was put on hold for five weeks due to the death of the presiding judge. Another judge was eventually appointed, and the trial continued. The prosecution opened the trial with the golf club cover, and they told the jurors that attorney John Sears hid the club cover in his office and didn't reveal it until Steve's arrest. While the attorney admitted to keeping the club cover, it didn't affect the outcome of the investigation. The prosecutors argued that the cover he kept belonged to the real murder weapon. However, with no murder weapon in sight, they weren't able to prove that theory, as all they really had were dead leads that couldn't be proven without any hard evidence. The prosecutors called further witnesses to shed more light on the shoe prints and tire tracks, but no matter how hard they tried, the prosecutors knew they were fighting a losing battle. They still had no murder weapon and nothing to tie Steve to the crime scene. Plus, the anonymous email sent before the trial held information that was in direct contrast to their entire argument. Things were looking bleak, but that's when a star witness appeared to put the final nail in Steve's coffin. Renee Girard had been Steve's girlfriend for two years. The pair started dating when Steve and Carol separated, and they'd been together since. Just like the Demockers, Renee stood by Steve during the investigation. She'd been questioned by detectives earlier, and she told them that Steve was an upstanding man. However, the couple had broken up during the break in the trial, and it wasn't long before Renee reached out to prosecutors. 
This time, she told them a very different story, and the details shocked the entire court. Renee told the court that Steve had called her a few days before visitation to tell her he had gotten some information on Carol's murder. On the day of visitation, Renee went with Charlotte to Camp Verde Jail. During the jailhouse visit, Steve told them that he heard an unknown voice through the vent in his cell, and the voice had told him who Carol's real murderers were. Renee would later recall Steve's statements, saying, quote, He told me people were looking for Jim Knapp because Jim Knapp was involved in some kind of prescription drug ring, and that these people were coming to look for him either to collect money or get something, and that they had gone into the house and encountered Carol instead of Jim Knapp. Steve wrote out all of the details on a note before handing it to his visitors. He then asked his daughter Charlotte, who was only 17 at the time, to drive 100 miles south to Phoenix to send the note's details as an anonymous email from a cafe to the prosecution and his defense attorney. He told his daughter that he couldn't do it himself because the prosecutors and his defense might not believe the story if it came from him, which is why it would be much more credible coming from someone else. Charlotte, who still believed in her father's innocence and wanted to help him in any way she could, did as she was told. Renee's incriminating statements left the prosecutors and the detectives dumbfounded, as that proved Steve was behind the supposedly anonymous email that had been sent. Renee would also lead the prosecutors to hard evidence. Steve had apparently packed a getaway bag. The bag contained clothes and a burner phone, and it was hidden near the eighth hole of what is today called the Capitol Canyon Golf Course. She told the prosecutors that he kept it there in case he had a chance to make a run for it. She recalled Steve's behavior during the time he packed the bag, saying, quote, He was constantly gripped with fear, fear of being arrested, and he was obsessed with plans to flee. In addition to Renee's testimony, another bombshell was revealed. The detectives had been investigating the insurance money trail that both Steve and his defense had boldly claimed was given to his daughters because he wanted nothing to do with it. But detectives had found out through a phone call Steve made in jail that while the money was indeed paid to Katie and Charlotte, it was immediately transferred into numerous accounts, including wire transfers to Steve's parents' account. They then sent those funds to James DeMocker, who transferred it all to Steve's defense team. The phone call between Steve and Katie was one of the crucial pieces of evidence used to uncover Steve's scheme, and Katie, who wanted to keep a part of it for Charlotte's college, was recorded arguing with Steve, who wanted to put all of the funds into his defense. I need to be sure that I can make sure that Charlotte goes to college. I understand your concern, but that, that, is, what, that is unfortunately at this point, that has to be down the scale of priorities below bond first, defense second. The amount of money that I was planning on setting aside for Charlotte is not going to significantly impede upon any of that. Sweetie, uh, l let me be as direct as I can, and I don't want to get into a fight, but I want to make sure we're clear with each other. The only reason that it is even coming under, we, we need to be certain that there is nothing, you know, it, the worst case scenario wouldn't occur until after uh, that money is spent. And we, we may need, we may need very little of it if things go the way we're trying to make them go here, but we may need every penny of it for defense. And I need to make certain that you understand that there will be no impediment to that if that's what we need. And I need to make sure you understand that I am trying to take care of my little sister. I understand that you're trying to do that, but we're going to get an acquittal here. And if we don't... You don't know that. I'm really sorry to be that harsh, okay? But, like, I... And, of course, that is the most likely outcome. And, of course, it's 99% sure that that's going to happen. And that's what we all want, and that's what it is. We will spend every little bit that we can doing and, the, and time, energy, resources, whatever. Of course, that's what we all want. But you cannot say beyond a shadow of a doubt that that is what is going to happen. No, that's absolutely right. Let me correct myself. His daughter's education was a lower priority than his own legal defense. What an asshole.
The incriminating evidence left Sears and the rest of Steve's defense with no other option but to withdraw from the case. And on November 12, 2010, the judge declared a mistrial. Steve's stupid mistake cost him an additional three years behind bars before his trial was finally put back in court. He had no money left after illegally using Carol's entire life insurance money to fund his previous defense, and with no money to pay a new attorney, his only option was the court-appointed public defender. Craig Williams and Greg Parzich were the ones appointed to try to pick up the pieces of Steve's case. It was hard, as Steve had not only fooled his own defense with the anonymous email, but he'd also lied to his family and involved his youngest daughter, who was still a minor at the time. The prosecutors came into the new trial guns blazing, as they were not only charging Steve with murder, they were also charging him with fraud, burglary, and manufactured fictitious evidence. It wasn't looking good for Steve's defense, but they had one last card to play, and that was Mr. 603. During the three-year-long wait, the state finally determined the identity of the DNA, and it belonged to a deceased 68-year-old man named Ronald Berman. The burning question to solve then was how the DNA of a deceased man was found under Carol's fingernails, and it was revealed that Ronald Berman was the person the medical examiner did an autopsy on an hour and a half before Carol's autopsy. Due to that, the defense doubled down on the incompetence of the medical examiner who hadn't properly cleaned his tools and carried over DNA from a corpse to Carol's body. The medical examiner was also accused of transporting the victim's corpse in the bed of his pickup truck and sending Carol's severed head to one lab for analysis and her torso to another lab because the technology in his lab was bad. They also criticized the sheriff's department, saying they had badly compromised the crime scene by not preserving it and not properly sealing the entire area off from the outside. The defense also believed that, due to those bad practices and the badly bungled investigation, Carol's real killer may never be found. With all the new information, the prosecutors actually had an even more solid case. Charlotte was called to the stand to testify under a grant of immunity, and while she still believed in her father's innocence, Charlotte confessed to the court that she wrote and sent the supposed anonymous email. Katie was also called to the stand, and she told the jurors that she was told to transfer the money to her grandparents for her father's defense. Their star witness, Renee Gerard, later took the stand, and she told the court everything she'd told the investigators. After all the witnesses' statements, the prosecutor told the jurors that even though they had never found the golf club that was used as the murder weapon, the receipt found in Steve's possession proved its existence. Furthermore, additional investigations by the crime scene analyst into the blood spatter revealed that the killer was left-handed, a description that perfectly matched Steve. They believed that a few days before the murder, Steve had taken the Big Bertha Sevenwood Golf Club to Carol's house and left it there telling her it was for a garage sale. He then sneaked back into the house knowing her jogging routine and brutally murdered her on July 2nd, 2008, and with that, the prosecution rested. Steve's defense tried to point their fingers at Jim Knapp again, even going as far as to bring Jim's ex-girlfriend as a witness to tell the court how Jim threatened her after their breakup. But no matter how hard they tried to make Steve look innocent, the jury wasn't buying it. It took the jurors three days of deliberations, and on October 4, 2013, Steve DeMocker was found guilty on all charges. Destroyed by the verdict, Steve's daughters begged the judge for mercy during sentencing, but their grandmother, Ruth Kennedy, urged the judge to give Steve the maximum sentence possible. Steve was sentenced on January 24, 2014. He would speak to the court that day, maintaining his innocence. I did not kill Carol. We loved each other for more than 20 years, and to believe me capable of violence against her, I would no more have harmed her than I would harm my daughters by taking her from them. I'd like to thank my family, and I'd like my daughters in particular to know how proud I am of the strength and the grace with which they have faced both the loss of their mother and the loss of their father. I don't know, Steve. You seem like the kind of guy that would absolutely harm your daughters if you could gain from it financially. Katie and Charlotte also gave emotional statements, begging the judge once again for leniency. 
The judge passed down Steve's sentence, saying, quote, The thing I can't get by is this horrific crime scene. I saw these pictures and I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to erase these from my mind. This was a premeditated murder. It was a brutal murder and from all appearances, the motive was money. So on count one, murder in the first degree, the sentence I'm going to impose is natural life in prison. Steve DeMocker was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole plus 10 years. Steve, who is now 69 years old, is currently living out his sentence at the Arizona State Prison Complex and he'll remain there for the rest of his days. He killed his ex-wife, the mother of his children, for money. If he's not a monster, I don't know who is. If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.